Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to talk here about the project Forest Care. I'm Sebastian Paczkowski, and I'm the deputy uh, project manager of this project. Uh, my background is not IT, so that's also why I'm very happy to uh, be able to talk here to so many IT guys. It's my first time, actually, and I think uh, yeah, as an uh, interesting bridge or, or end of this uh, summer school, it might be very interesting for you to hear some details about this quite interesting and quite challenging project from the IT side. However, of course, I cannot give you so much details on the IT in general. Maybe Julian might comment on this, but I will show you the general overview and our methodology uh, that we use to assess the forest. So uh, my background is forestry and wood technology. I also have some qualifications in chemical ecology, which comes into play in this project as well, because we are also uh, not only looking at the forest, but also kind of smelling the forest. I will tell you what this means in detail later. And uh, I also worked a little bit in bioenergy and in the chemistry of biomaterials during my time at the University of Freiburg. So, um, here in this project, it's a more a GIS-related project, and the general idea of the project Forest Care is to get more information about forests because we desperately need them. I mean, um, IT in forestry is not so much developed as it could be, so there is a lot of room for improvement, like in other industries, and uh, this somehow gave rise to this idea of the project forest care because we see that uh, forests are quite important when it comes to climate change they influence the local climate of course and uh, soothe a little bit the higher temperatures so um, and also they store a lot of co2 and as we can see in climate change the forests suffer we saw this over the last years intensively in germany but also in other places and uh, yeah therefore a more intense monitoring uh, needs to be developed in order to be, uh, be a little bit more responsive to these changes due to the changing climate. So uh, the structure I uh, will follow is first of all to introduce in detail to the approach of the project Forest Care, and then I will introduce the consortium that is working on these project ideas. And finally, we might uh, end in a nice discussion. Maybe you give some input, some ideas, uh, how you can, uh, how you think these problems can be solved from the IT point of view. I think this would be very nice here to make such a discussion. Uh, because it also will help me to understand your perspective after I introduced uh, you to my perspective on these things. Yeah, so what is the approach of the Project Forest Care? The problem statement I already mentioned, uh, we definitely have a problem in forestry. The climate change induces uh, mainly drought, but also more severe storms, although I think the drought in the last years was the more dominant problem. So basically the trees run out of water. And uh, as there exist different tree species uh, in the forest, some respond very bad to this water stress and others are more resistant. So there are definitely differences. In Germany, a big topic is uh, this, the tree uh, spruce which is a needle tree. And uh, we have a little bit of problem with this tree because it is not really native to all the regions in Germany. It's a tree that comes from the mountains. So it usually grows above 1000 meters approximately, height meters. And uh, when you plant it in other regions, it can be quite weak. Yeah, and uh, that's a problem then, especially under severe climate conditions. Um, yeah, also uh, the forestry in the past, not so much now, but in the past, uh, was had the idea to get the maximum uh, timber yield out of a forest, the maximum wood yield. So uh, these spruce trees were planted very close to each other, which had the effect that they competed for the sun and they were growing up very fast, but stayed very thin. So this is already a very unstable situation. Of course, the foresters then made what we call thinning. So they cut it out the smaller ones to give more space for the larger ones, and then they grow broader and get more stable. But still, spruce is not adapted in the lowlands. And so when the big droughts came over the last years, especially the spruce tree 
had big problems. Even in some mountainous regions, in the Harz, for example, uh, large areas simply died away, thousands of hectares. Yeah, so that's a big problem. And you can see here some numbers. So uh, in these years, we had 160.5 million cubic meters all over Germany only. Other countries suffered, of course, as well, of calamity wood. So calamity wood is uh, trees that had to be felled because they were too weak. And uh, one third of this amount here was because of storm and two thirds because of bark beetles. So uh, with the bark beetles, it's a little bit like this. When the tree is already weakened by the drought, it cannot defend itself anymore so much. So that means that bark beetles who bore through the bark into the cambium, the living uh, layer of the tree, so to say, um, between the wood and the bark, and there they feed and lay their eggs and the uh, offsprings they hatch there. And uh, in very hot years, they tend to make what we call a gradation. So gradation means that the population basically explodes from a few beetles to millions of beetles. Yeah, you could see the videos in the internet where there were beetles virtually swarming in the forest. And uh, when the population grows so large, these beetles are also able to attack healthy trees because these, especially spruce trees, they have resin inside their, uh, inside their stem. And when the tree is attacked, they try to resonate the beetle out. Yeah, because when the beetle damages the tree, the resin flows into this damage and the beetle is kind of washed out. Of course, uh, the tree is not able to defend an uh, unlimited number of beetles. So when there is a healthy tree, but millions of beetles, sooner or later a beetle will succeed. And then over time, the trees will die. So this is a very big problem. We had such problems in Europe uh, also in the past, in the last century. And this again is another uh, very strong bark beetle calamity. You can find comparable things in the US and in Canada as well, where enormously large areas are destroyed by the bark beetle. So uh, what's the problem? I mean, you could say the tree is not really, the, the wood of the tree is not really damaged. So just fell it and take it and use it. But the problem is that forestry is uh, sustainable. So uh, all the harvesting methods exist and all the um, enterprises that do the harvesting they are, of course, operating at a certain maximum limit. So they bought harvesters, they have manpower for a certain amount to be felt per year, because this amount shall not be exceeded, because otherwise forestry will not be sustainable anymore. Sustainable means that you never cut more than is regrowing. This is a very important aspect in forestry. Otherwise, the trees, the, the forest would get smaller. And this is not what we want. Yeah, We want to sustain our forest but use it as well. So you never cut more than is regrown. And so all the enterprises uh, were not prepared for such a calamity. And which is uh, also problematic, of course, when you have the perspective, you have now, let's say two, three, or potentially four problematic years, but afterwards these uh, crises will be gone probably, then you don't buy a new harvester with an investment volume of half a million euro, because you know that after four years you haven't kind of uh, um, used it appropriately. So there is, uh, after these four years, it would just stand in the shed and be unused, which is bound capital, and the enterprises in such cases never buy uh, more harvesters. Yeah. So. The result was that most of the damaged trees had to be uh, left in the forest, which uh, also kind of fired this problem because when you don't fell the trees fast, then the beetle develops stronger. And so you have an amplitude and, and multiplication of the problem. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was uh, one of the problems in this crisis. And finally, it had a strong effect on the stem price, which again was a bit demotivating for the foresters because when there is so much wood on the market, the price drops severely. And then uh, in the middle of the crisis last year, we had a, a cubic meter price for wood that was below the costs for harvesting it. Yeah. So in this case, a forester would never emphasize to harvest because he would make miners anyway. Yeah. And this again was a problem of the crisis. So you see in basically the conclusion, an unstable forest is not what we want. 
not from any perspective, neither be it CO2 storing or economic perspective. So we need a stable forest. And that's where forest care comes into play, where uh, we want to monitor the areas where the forest grows on the basis of single trees so that we can define the vitality of single trees and by this understand which species is adapted to this particular stand and which species is not which will give a perspective for the future to plant only species that are adapted to these stands to get a stable forest so one general conclusion is uh, already drawn so we want to get away from spruce Although this has been done also decades before. So when I was in my practice session during my forestry studies, this already went on. Of course, trees tend to grow slow. So <laughs> now these trees are uh, a bit bigger at the moment. So uh, they planted deciduous trees like beech trees or oak trees, which are more stable. Um, on the other hand, a new experience is that due to the more severe drought due, induced by climate change, also beech trees suffer. Yeah, so the idea just to wipe away the spruce and to plant uh, any deciduous trees doesn't work out either. So we need better alternatives and Forest Care wants to create these alternatives or basically wants to set up a monitoring system that allows to give this perspective to define resistant tree species for special stems. Exactly. So first of all, uh, an early detection of the bark beetle is one of the focuses here. You can do this, of course, by optical cameras, but you can do this also by this particular smelling that I will introduce to you later. Um, here you have a picture where you can basically see the problem. So uh, this, what you see here is the bark beetle when it feeds on the tree, it leaves these little channels here on the uh, cambium. The cambium is the living tissue. So there the uh, tree transports the sugars that it creates by photosynthesis in the leaves down to the roots. So it's kind of a motorway of energy. And if this motorway is interrupted because you have too many of these uh, feeding here, when it goes around the tree, then the whole cambium is disrupted. The sugar cannot reach the roots and the tree will, of course, die. Yeah. And uh, in order to avoid that such a situation explodes in this gradation I was talking about, it is very important to find these early infested trees as fast as possible. At the moment, this is done. The foresters walk through the forest and they watch if they see some resonating out of these boreholes. And then they see, ah, oh, this tree is infested, this tree is infested. And then they uh, tell their workers to fell these trees in order to prevent that degradation takes place. But of course, for foresters who walk through the forest, it's not possible to, take, to detect all of the infested trees. And the workload is simply too high. We have thousands of hectares in Germany. You cannot walk through them in each spring or summer. And therefore, we need uh, technical systems that do this automatically. So basically, what we need is a high special and temporal resolution monitoring of single tree vitality in general and also in reference to the bark beetle. And uh, this can only be done by technical devices. So drones and satellites are here uh, a feasible tool that we want to use in the project. And yeah, then we want to select species, as I said, which are resistant to drought. Here I gave you some examples which are kind of in the uh, selection area for potential uh, forest of the future. We have Libanese cedar or Douglas fir. Douglas fir already exists in Germany in relatively large amounts. Lebanese cedar is uh, kind of a newcomer, but there are also other uh, deciduous tree species which are in the focus, like uh, special oak species that are resistant towards drought. Yeah, so the aim is the detection of forest characteristics on single tree level, which is quite challenging actually, uh, with drone and satellite data. So here you see uh, kind of a picture of a forest that was uh, recorded by a multispectral camera and uh, was calculated to, was processed to a three-dimensional picture. Um, of course, the colors here represent uh, the domination of certain channels in the multispectral uh, region, and they can give some information about the vitality of the tree. 
This photo was recorded by uh, Dr. Pavandatta. Uh, the University of Freiburg is one of our collaborators. And in an early phase before the project, uh, we went to Bavaria and recorded this area. Yeah, so what is the basic workflow of the data acquisition? Not the data processing, now only the data acquisition. Um, first of all, we do a single tree characterization in the stand. This is um, both a bit, yeah, I would say uncommon and also very challenging, which might be the reason why it is so uncommon, because we actually uh, do walk through the forest like a forester, but we stop at every single tree and uh, position the tree by a GPS system. And then uh, we uh, define the tree by species, by vitality and by stem diameter, because this is finally our label that we want to use in the later KI processing, AI processing. And um, yeah, it's quite a lot of work actually, and it is uh, combined with a lot of complications. Maybe I can show you here this GPS that we use. I prepared it here. So this is the head of the antenna. Of course, there's always a pole below. And uh, this is kind of a professional GPS antenna. Um, and uh, with this, uh, usually architects use it or engineers on construction areas to get very millimeter precise uh, positions. It has a RTK system. So RTK means it gets online correction signals from different uh, stations to find out about the recent deviation of the satellite signal to the stations. So the station, of course, knows where it is. And uh, the satellites send the station position in, I think, in a, a resolution below one second. Yeah? So the station always gets the position from the satellites where it exactly is. But the station knows where it is exactly. And sometimes there are some deviations due to the uh, characteristics of the atmosphere that kind of disturbs the signal that comes from the satellite. And so there's always a little deviation. And this deviation uh, is known by the station because the station knows where it is. It has the satellite signal, it can calculate the difference. And this difference is sent online as a correction signal to this antenna, which means that this the signal that the antenna receives from the satellite is corrected by the same deviation, which makes such antennas with RTK system uh, millimeter precise, ideally. In the forest, of course, we have a general problem because, um, first of all, the trees kind of shade the satellite signal, so we don't have as much satellites as we have um, uh, as we have on a free plane. Yeah, uh, same problem in architecture when you are close to a building. Yeah, so uh, we have less satellites and also the RTK signal, which comes via um, uh, USTM data uh, connection, is also uh, a little bit blocked. Yeah, so this is a big challenge we have to deal with that sometimes we don't get a good signal, sometimes no signal at all, no position at all. So uh, we want to work with a base station rover scenario where we set up a base station outside the forest, which knows exactly where it is. It's like a small one of these uh, bigger stations that give the correction signals. So we have a small base station for us where we know where it is. And this sends via radio signal the correction signal to the rover, which is in the forest. This is our idea how we want to work. However, we are still in the starting phase of the project. So we develop this. We already don't have all of the equipment. Uh, this is in general a problem to get equipment at the moment, but uh, we are on it. And so the idea is to create very precise georeference labels for each and every tree, which is a lot of work because you can assume when I want to uh, train an AI to see even if it's only the tree species, I would need, yeah, I assume Google needs 5,000 pictures of a car to know what is a car. So um, uh, it would be 5,000 pictures of a beech tree, 5,000 pictures of an acorn tree, 5,000 pictures of a spruce tree. Yeah, so that's a lot of work for us. We might not complete it completely in the two years given in the project, but we will make a big start. And I think it's very important to rethink these um, stand evaluations, many studies exist which just take the drone data and some statistics of the forestry stands. It's very common to have some uh, statistics on forestry stands because usually the foresters don't measure each and every single tree. They just go into the forest, 
in one hectare, they make a measurement circle, they measure all the trees in this measurement circle, and then they extrapolate the uh, size and the combination of species to the whole hectare, which is of course not very precise, but for the moment it was precise enough. But we want to push this one step further to get a very precise and single tree based assessment of the forest stands to be able to really understand uh, the vitality of the trees, the combination of species, and what would be the best shift in species composition for this particular stand. Yeah, so uh, then drone data will be recorded. And uh, here we use this electronic nose to smell the trees. We use multispectral cameras, which is kind of uh, state of the art. We also want to introduce a hyperspectral camera which we couldn't board in the project, but we will lend it. So uh, there will be some hyperspectral data, very interesting topic actually. And uh, LIDAR data will be recorded by the drone as well. And then finally we have satellite data because the big vision is of course, uh, with a drone like this one here, yeah, uh, you could fly over a hectare and we already did some test flights. So when you want to have a really good resolution, uh, it takes about 40 minutes at least for one hectare. One hectare, for those who do not know this unit, is 100 meters times 100 meters, so 10,000 square meters. Uh, it's not really that large, but uh, yeah, this takes about 40 minutes for one camera only. The drone can carry maximum of two cameras at a time. We are working with uh, four cameras, so it would be at least two times 40 minutes, which is uh, a large time when you assume uh, that normal um, forestry districts, which are uh, assessed by one forester, is more than 1,000 hectares. You can easily see that you could never fly above 1,000 hectares with a drone. This will take really a lot of time and uh, work capacity. So the final goal, of course, is to transfer the information that we got from the drone and from the single tree characterization to satellite data. Because with satellite data, we have already a quite good resolution, not close to what we get by the drones, but it's already quite good. And uh, if we can um, train an AI to understand the vitality of the forest by satellite data, this would be a, a great step forward because we can get um, a high special level and um, yeah, also a high time resolution of the forest canopy, how it develops. And then uh, we could easily find out about the vitality of the trees. Of course, this is kind of a, yeah, I wouldn't call it a dream, but it's a long perspective. But we want to make the start for this in this project by assessing the single tree characterization in the stand and by developing AI algorithms that work for drone data. And so to see if they can be transferred to satellite data. And with the satellite data, we use the multispectral in general and also a thermal. And ZAR is included as well, but we have partners for this because ZAR analytics with satellites is quite a special topic. We will not cover it directly uh, in this project, but we have partners in uh, Switzerland who uh, want to support us. Here. Yeah, coming back to the single tree characteristic characterization in the stand, I already told you that we work with this uh, GPS antenna assisted. And here you see the app that we have already developed. Uh, our partner company, Conterra in Münster, has developed this uh, app. And uh, next week we will get the first delivering of the app and then we can start assessing the trees. So you can see you on the map, you always see uh, in the app, you always see the map here and your position. And when you walk around, this position changes. And then you click on a new tree. And this mask here is opening, this window is opening, and you can define the um, class of the tree, if it's deciduous tree or if it's uh, a needle or coniferous tree. You can define the species, you can uh, define the diameter. We have a caliper that is uh, Bluetooth connected to our tablet that we took take in the forest. So we can um, yeah, automatically measure the tree and transfer the data via Bluetooth on the tablet. And uh, then we can uh, select certain vitality parameters here for the tree. I have I've, uh, copied here some photos that we already made. So here you can see this resin flow. Yeah. And here you can see a damage that was uh, caused by felling another tree, which kind of hit this tree. This is quite common, especially at transportation roads 
uh, they have these damages here. And here you see an oak tree where the crown is kind of thin. So uh, even though it's summer now, there are not all twigs with leaves and you can see some gaps here. Um, so this is drought stress, yeah, uh, small drought stress. And what we also do for the later processing uh, of the AI, uh, we uh, have different categories to assess these damages. So we have either it's a weak uh, damage, intermediate damage or very strong damage for almost every uh, damage that can be seen any damage, uh, any vitality characteristic that can be seen in the forest. So to allow the uh, the AI to differentiate between different levels of vitality class damage. Of course, this will be quite challenging for our team because we have to define the parameters, what is weak, what is intermediate, what is strong for each and every vitality parameter. And uh, subjectivity plays a strong role here. And this will definitely uh, cause dirty data. So we are on it to, uh, homogenize this assessment as good as possible. Yeah, But of course, uh, the company Conterra wants to sell the app later and this issue will always show up that if other users will use this app to get the categories uh, of the vitality class, uh, there might be strong deviations. Yeah, This is something that we want to uh, get a grip on by presenting these photos in the app. So all the users uh, can always click on the certain damage category and then a picture is shown how it looks like, yeah. what is a severe resin flow, what is a small resin flow, what is an intermediate resin flow. And by this, we want to manage it. That we uh, yeah, reduce the subjectivity and reduce the dirty data. Yeah, here is some uh, information on the electronic nose. I also brought you uh, one commercial electronic nose here so that you um, you can see what it is. So this is basically the processing unit via USB. You can plug it to the PC. And uh, here on the cable, you put, you can see there's four pins. You put such one of these uh, sensor heads here. And if you look at the sensor heads, let me show you. Four pins and on top, now it's not, cannot be seen almost microscope style. Yeah, uh, so here is a little plate. Here is a little plate and this plate is uh, heated by the device. And this plate is a semiconductor. So the idea is here that by heating the semiconductor, according to Fermi's law, you make it, um, yeah, you allow a conductance and uh, this can be measured as a voltage. So uh, two of these pins here, Two of the pins, they send a voltage over the little semiconductor plate and the other two pins, they are responsible for heating this plate. Yeah. And uh, the voltage changes when a volatile compound and a smell component, so to say an order, touches the surface because it oxidizes. And semiconductors, in this case, it is uh, tungsten oxide, for instance, or um, uh, zinc oxide and uh, the oxygen in this metal grid has a certain oxidation stage of course and when a volatile touches it and burns this thermal oxidation that happens of course changes the oxidation state of the oxygen in the metal grid in the semiconductor metal grid so some components some orders they reduce the oxygen others oxidize the oxygen and this uh, changes the Fermi level which means that also the voltage changes. So basically you could say uh, the conductance of the surface changes and this can be measured by Ohm's law uh, in form of a, difference, of a difference in voltage. So you can make uh, this order electronically visible. Yeah, and uh, what this means you can see here. So we have different concentrations in this case of alpha pinene. Alpha pinene is a compound that is in the resin of the tree. So when the beetles bore into the tree, this resin comes out. And with this, of course, also the alpha pinene comes out. The idea of resin is basically um, that there are resin acids inside and there is a, a solvent that keeps the resin acids in a flow, so to say. And this, flow, and this solvent, this is the monoterpenes and the major component of monoterpenes is alpha pinene. So when now the uh, resin acid uh, monoterpene mixture comes out of the tree, 
the monoterpenes evaporate immediately because they have a very uh, high vapor pressure. So they go into the air as the order. And the resin acids, they, um, yeah, they polymerize and they close the wound. This is the trick basically of the tree. And the smell uh, sometimes comes also through the needles, through the stomata and the needles. So at a warm summer day, when you walk through a pine forest, for instance, you can definitely smell this uh, alpha pinning or also other monotherapy compounds. Yeah, it's a little bit when you walk like uh, through eucalypt forests, you can smell this eucalyptol, which is also a monotherapy. And it's the same with pine trees and spruce. Yeah, so basically by this, we make the order of a tree visible. And if you attach such a sensor to a drone, the trick would be that you measure the volatiles that come up. So if you have some damage here on the uh, stem, which is a typical place where Ipsticographus would attack, this is the major um, bark beetle, the, the, the species that causes the biggest problem of bark beetles, uh, then the orders are expected to raise up here and you can measure them above the crown. Of course, a bit challenging, but there are also other species which are directly in the crown, like Pityogenes chalcographus. Uh, they can be more easily assessed. However, they are not so uh, um, lethal to trees because they only damage the small trees here and they don't interrupt the, um, the sugar flow. Yeah, but they are often associated with Ipstipographus. So in this combination, Ipstipographus here and Pityogenes chalcographus here, you could definitely uh, smell such trees. Um, last year, we did our first flights with a prototype of this drone here. It was not the drone here, but it was from another company that made a special prototype for us. And we were able to generate this heat map. Uh, it were, I have to say, we also published this, but uh, when you uh, want to read this publication, you will see that I clearly wrote that this does not confirm the concept yet because we were flying under conditions because of the development of time. It was uh, far too cold. We had 13 degree or so, which was, it was in autumn actually. And in autumn also the bark beetle is not really active. So this was just a preliminary flight test to see if we get any data and yes we get and we also could interpolate it and you can see here in this heat map at the hot spots the sensor had a peak and at the blue spots uh, the sensor did not peak so the concentration of uh, monoterpenes especially alpha pinene is high in the red regions and low in the blue regions and uh, we want to repeat this as soon as possible at the moment unfortunately i don't have a prototype at hand but as soon as I have, we will fly again over the forests and see if we can identify freshly infested trees. Because this is basically the goal, that uh, by this system, we can smell if a tree is infested by bark beetles before the needles change the color. Because here, if the energy flow is interrupted, the tree dies, and dying means you yeah, Wilking, if you want to say like this, but in general, also the needles, uh, they they get first a little bit yellow and then more red, red, red. And then at the end, uh, the tree is completely gray. So uh, when the tree is red, you might detect it by cameras when you fly over it, maybe even when large areas are dead by satellites. But this is definitely too late because when uh, the needles get red, it's at least four weeks after the initial damage, at least. Usually it's almost half a year or one year after. And uh, then the uh, bark beetle has already increased its population. So we have this problem I described at the beginning that many, many individuals swarm around and attack just any living trees, any healthy trees and uh, kill them. So uh, if, this st uh, if this state has reached, the foresters can do nothing. I explained this problem to you. So here this drone was designed to prevent that the beetle is doing this gradation. And as you cannot see it by optical means, because the needles are still green, the only way to do it is to smell it by a high monoterpene concentration. And then the forester could uh, go to these few trees which have initial infestation, cut them, and then the beetle will die. And uh, then the problem itself will be prevented. This is the vision of this part of the project. Okay, of course, we also use a conventional approach. We use the uh, multi-spectral cameras. Here you can see an example uh, of such a colored stand. So the idea is basically that you take the optical spectrum 
and you take only special channels out of this optical spectrum um, in order to analyze them in particular. And then you can see if a tree tends to be more in the red edge spectrum or some twigs actually are more in the red edge spectrum, there must be some damage because this means from if it's a leaf, it starts to wilt. If it's a needle, it starts to get a little bit yellow. Yeah, and also you can uh, get some information in, about the water content. Sorry, uh, about the water content of the needles. So you can also get some information of drought. Yeah, and uh, to, just to show you how such a multispectral camera would look like, um, this is one. Of course, there are many on the market, so uh, don't be fixed on this company. There are many companies who produce such, and you can see that here we have uh, not one lens, but we have actually 10 lenses, and behind each lens, there is a sensor that detects a certain frequency. Of course, not a single frequency, but uh, it's a frequency range that covers several nanometers of the optical spectrum. But uh, the idea here is that you don't make one picture and analyze the colors afterwards, but you make 10 pictures and you have already separated the colors. Yeah, And this allows you to get a better resolution of the single parts of the spectrum. Yeah, and another version of the camera is here. It has basically the same five channels as the other red one uh, and also a thermal camera here so we can assess the thermal. The point is that here the resolution is much better although we have only five channels but we have a better resolution so the idea is here to go below the centimeter resolution and to understand on millimeter level uh, the vitality of the twigs of the leaves of the needles. Of course these leaves are still with the challenge to fly very close to the canopy. And this uh, also creates a massive amount of data because when you fly uh, very close to the trees, let's say in, in 10 meter distance or so, um, you will have to make a lot of pictures to be aligned later to a large picture. Yeah? And uh, when you do this, you have to make a lot of pictures, of course, and uh, every picture is a few megabytes. So we end up usually our test flights with half a hectare and a very slow flying because uh, if you fly too fast the pictures get uh, blurred yeah so you have to fly very slow make many pictures and uh, we ended up with our first flight with about 200 gigabytes per hectare which is still not that much as you would get with a hyperspectral camera when we introduce a hyperspectral camera we will surely end up in the terabyte region yeah, for one hectare only one hectare 100 per 100 meters so you can imagine if you assess 100 hectares, how much data this is. And this is exactly where the GVDG comes into play uh, to manage all this large big data. Uh, we, of course, need assistance. Yeah, you can also calculate the vegetation index. There are formulas. I didn't show them to you, but the idea is uh, simple. You relativate the different multispectral channels to each other in a formula in a certain way, and then you get an index. And this index tells something about the vitality. Yeah, so there are indices for uh, water stress, indices for this uh, red edge wilking index. Yeah, so that you can see that the plant is damaged. And uh, yeah, this we also want to use, of course. Probably we might develop some new indices based on the results of the AI. Yeah, just some insight here because uh, yesterday when I prepared the slides, I asked myself this because it doesn't seem so logic. I mean, you have these uh, handy sensors, yeah, mobile phone sensors, and they have a very good resolution. They cover a large band of colors. So why use multispectral cameras? Why isolating the channels? And here is the answer I found in the internet. So the RGB camera sensors, they are quite good, but they have a, a very large um, distribution of the blue channel, of the red channel, which is even interrupting here with the blue, and the green channel. Yeah, so it is definitely a separation of colors, but the separation is so bad that if you want to isolate only the blue and only the red, you will get not so precise information of the real red and the real blue, so to say. And uh, here, the multispectral camera sensors, they have for each and every um, frequency width, they have a separate camera, a separate sensor, which means that these colors can be separated quite precisely. And the red edge then is really only the red edge and the yellow is really only yellow and so on. 
So this is the reason why I use multispectral cameras. And I think you can imagine with a hyperspectral camera, which has in this region here, where the multispectral camera has, let's say, eight or 10 bands, the, multi the hyperspectral camera has 250 bands, for instance, or some have a little less, some a little more. There are also various uh, models on the market. But uh, you can imagine what this means in terms of uh, data masses. And you have uh, for all two or three nanometers frequency a uh, single sensor. So this creates a lot of data, but it allows also to be uh, to analyze the state of the tree in a very precise manner because you can really select by AI processing the channel that really gives an information about the vitality of the tree and that allows you the earliest to find out if the vitality goes down. Yeah. And uh, this makes forestry, from this point of view, very fast responsive uh, to damages. Yeah, and we will use the LiDAR. I showed you here some picture. Of course, we will not photograph the forest from inside, but from above. But basically, you create point clouds. And uh, without the colors, of course, here these colors, they came in afterwards. Usually, it's gray when you have this LiDAR. Because LiDAR is an active laser that is kind of... Um, yeah, sending out rays to the forest canopy where the rays return and the time from sending to return is the distance. So you can make a three-dimensional model. These three-dimensional models have some advantages over the three-dimensional models that you can calculate from multispectral RGB pictures because there you can also calculate three-dimensional models, but they have a lower precision. So here with LiDAR, we hope to get a, a very clear insight into the geometry of the trees. And uh, for instance, uh, when I uh, showed you the picture of this oak tree where the leaves were not completely covering the twigs, it was a bit hard to see on the picture, but that's exactly the point. We want to make it visible when the first leaves are gone uh, and there is obviously some drought stress. We want to uh, use this LiDAR data to understand this. Or possibly if a whole tree starts to wilt, uh, it will not uh, immediately lose the leaves, but the leaves will curl due to the wilting. And uh, we hope to make this visible by LiDAR as well, by a special response. Yeah. Uh, of course, the LiDAR we have is not one of the latest state of the art. So full waveform LiDAR is the state of the art. We might be so fortunate to introduce such a sensor more at the end of the project. But at the moment, we have to work with a small um, conventional LiDAR, which has only three uh, layers of return. And uh, we will see how we increase the resolution here, probably by flying quite close to the canopy and by flying quite slow. Um, yeah, and flying close to the canopy, of course, is very challenging, as I mentioned, because we need not to collide with the trees. The first flights were therefore quite uh, exciting, <laughs> because uh, when such a drone crashes with such a sensor, it's also quite expensive. And uh, yeah, this uh, we use at the moment the digital elevation model of the uh, landscape to define the tree height. We try to use the digital surface model, so the uh, crown canopy itself, but we found that the drone um, is very unstable when it follows the um, the digital surface model because in between the trees there are gaps, so the drone goes down very fast, goes up again, and then the pictures are very blurred, so this is really not usable. So we use the digital elevation model. We keep a standard distance uh, above the ground, not above the tree, but above the ground. And this means that the resolution, of course, of the trees changes because the larger the tree is, the closer it is to the drone. Yeah, and we always have to orient ourselves on the largest trees. So ideally, we have very homogeneous stands where there's no big tree advancing over the smaller trees. <clears throat> so these are kind of limitations that we have to face at the moment. Of course, our project will not solve the complete problem. That's impossible in two years. But uh, we will see how much uh, information we can get with our approach and where is room for improvement for this system. Yeah, and uh, satellite data, we will focus on World View 3. This is one of the uh, more modern satellites uh, which are not free to assess. So we have some European system the, um, where you can get the data for free. But uh, here we have to pay for it. Anyway, we have a very good resolution for a satellite at least. 
the Worldview 3 RGB camera gives a resolution of 30 centimeters, which is, from my point of view, really great for a satellite. Uh, here you can see such a picture, so you can clearly identify the trees and hopefully also special features of the trees. Yeah. Then uh, a multispectral camera is on board with eight bands, which have a not so good resolution of 1.24 meters. So in this case, you can cover by one pixel probably, or maybe four pixels are crown, or let's say 10 pixels are crown, depending on the size of the crown. Uh, there you can get not so much information, but of course, clearly, when uh, there is a shift to the red, then you will most probably see it uh, by the value of the pixel. And uh, yeah, then we also work with the thermal bands. Uh, here the resolution is much worse, so you can basically assess the um, water content of the stand itself. I doubt that this will allow to assess the uh, water content of a single tree. Yeah, so when there's drought, we should see some changes here in thermal, but uh, more on stand basis or on small area basis. Okay, I see if uh, I want to have some discussion, I need to hurry up a little bit, but basically, as I'm a forester, I am uh, done with these basics that I developed in the last half year. And here, uh, I want to introduce you to the planned workflow of the data processing. So first of all, we want to take all the data layers from the cameras. They are all georeferenced, of course, because our drone is also working with RTK GPS precision, so it is centimeter precise, which means we can stack all the data layers of the different channels and the LiDAR and the thermal above each other. And then we have this array that we want to work with. Yeah? So the uh, deep CNN algorithm that we want to use, sorry, should analyze this uh, geo-referenced array. Of course, the first challenge will be to segment all the single trees. The, an algorithm should uh, segment the single trees to make a separate analysis of every single tree. This will be quite challenging because the tree crowns, they never have a constant geometry. Of course, you can approximate it with a circle or with a little yeah, uh, special geometry with a polygon. But uh, in fact, every tree crown is different from the other. So this segmentation uh, will be the first big challenge in the data analysis. If we have um, separated each tree from each other. We have these arrays for every tree. We know the um, label of the tree, which species, what vitality state, and then we will analyze this with HPC, first with conventional parametric analysis, uh, in order to yeah, kind of get a feeling what is possible correlation. And uh, then we will use conventional uh, AI algorithms with HPC, like a random forest, for instance. And finally, the major goal of the project, of course, is to work with deep CNN so that the areas are tiled, each layer of the area is tiled, or maybe some areas, uh, some layers of the array are merged and then tiled so that uh, we get a maximum of information out of our data. Yeah, and now allow me to introduce the consortium just uh, in short. Uh, the stand assessment here is done by our department, the Department of Forest Work Science and, uh, and Engineering at the Georg August Universität, close to the GWDG. We are just neighbors. And uh, Felix is our Freiburg part. Felix is the, um, yeah, the GIS uh, part of the um, yeah, Faculty of Natural Resources here in Freiburg. And uh, we have worked together since years. So in this project, we join again. And Phyllis mainly takes the part of the data processing, but they also fly with the drones and assess the stands in the region around Freiburg, while Avi is doing this in the region around Göttingen. And Conteva, I already mentioned, they uh, provide us with these uh, stand assessment app where we can go to the forest and classify the trees. They also want, uh, on an AI basis, develop a language input system so that we do not have to push the buttons on the uh, screen, but that we can uh, freely talk, so to say, with the program to define the vitality of the trees. The electronic nose development is also done by the Department of Forest Work Science and Engineering and by the GVDG because the data processing is quite special. You can imagine that when you have this heat map that I showed you, we have to cover the influence of the wind, which is very important when it comes to smell because the orders, they are 
blown away virtually. Yeah. So uh, in order to understand where they come from, we need to include the wind in our model. This will be very challenging. And this is only one of the challenging parts. So uh, let's see where we end up here. And uh, the company Cadmium should provide us with a drone. It's a Bavarian uh, company that builds drones, quite a small one. And the Forest Zoology, they um, provide us with the laboratory instrumentation to measure the smell in the forest. This I didn't cover here in this presentation because it's a minor aspect, but still we have to validate the electronic noise by measuring on laboratory scale um, how much alpha PNA is actually there. You know? And the drone flying will done by Felix and Avi as well. So we already started here in Freiburg to build up a workflow. And this will take for sure one or two more weeks that we have developed this workflow and then we can just produce data. Yeah. And here Cadmium is also active and Fraunhofer Ise should support us with the LIDAR data, uh, with the LIDAR data um, preparation. The parametric analysis is done by Phyllis and GVDG, of course, because they have the HPC uh, service. And Giscon is another company that works not only but also in forestry, GIS, and they are selling solutions to foresters and uh, to farmers, for instance, but also for city development and such stuff. They are active and uh, they want to profit, of course, from our approaches and transfer a bit to their portfolio so, uh, yeah, that the company can grow, of course. And here Fraunhofer Ise again is active for the LIDAR data. And then the final, the core part of the project, so to say, is covered by the GVDG, of course, with the HPC and providing the service. And uh, by Giscon and Conterra, who will be active here in the deep CNN. And as an associated partner, we have Esri in the board. The contact partner here recently got a professorship at the University of Würzburg, but is still associated to Esri. So uh, here we have, I think, a big partner in the board who is also very interested in what uh, we will end up with in the project. Yeah, and now I finished. It took me much longer than I expected. So thank you for your patience uh, with all this information that truly had not so much to do with IT, but hopefully uh, was very interesting for you because this is kind of the basic works that you have to do. You have to get the data from somewhere and the data has to be good. So I think uh, you see now uh, that it's quite challenging to develop such workflows to produce the data. And maybe you have some particular questions uh, how to produce the data. Maybe you have some suggestions. I would be very happy for you if you give some suggestions what can be improved, what has to be covered, especially where attention has to be drawn to. Or maybe we can just open a free discussion on the HPC um, processing of the data, where I cannot say so much, of course, but maybe Julian will help out. So please ask your question. Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for the talk. I think it was really great. And I knew you had a lot to say um, about it. So here, the first question is from Hans. He asks, what area size do you want to monitor? That's a very good question. Yeah, that's that's actually a very good question. And I spent, when I forged the project, so to say, I spent a lot of time in calculating. I even went so far to uh, to research for moving speeds that people would need to walk through a forest, depending on the steepness of the terrain and so on. I made a lot of calculations. And uh, at the end, it uh, kind of is a little bit problematic because we already started the project and we haven't covered one single hectare yet because we had problems in um, buying the material. Yeah, Two of the cameras that we wanted to have are not available from DJI. Uh, we work with DJI drone, by the way, uh, because there is a worldwide uh, yeah, chip uh, problem and so we cannot get the cameras and this of course affects also walking through the forest we cannot get the laptops that we need and so on so the original idea was that a person on an eight hour day can cover um about yeah i think it was one and a half hectare depending on the steepness it can differ yeah but let's assume one and a half hectare and so um the amount of hectares we wanted to cover in the project was about Göttingen and Freiburg together. We have two teams working in the forest. I think it was about 200 hectares. Yeah, but this was just a theoretical plan. I think in reality, we will end up with a lower area or we will have to apply for a prolonging of the project. 
Yeah. But assuming that on one hectare in the stands that we work in, we, we work with all the stands because there the crowns are more developed and we don't have so much understory. So it's easier to assess, easier to walk, easier to calculate. Yeah. Uh, there we have about 80 to 100 trees per hectare. So when you have 200 hectares with 100 trees per hectare, you can see we have, uh, how much is it? 20,000 trees? Yeah. I think so. So we have 20,000 trees that we plan to assess. Yeah, <laughs> probably it will be a bit less. Maybe I would add another question to this one directly. Mm -hmm. So um, is it planned, let's say, that you revisit uh, the same trees selectively, let's say, a year later or something? Because maybe then some of the damage actually showed the impact or something like that, or is it not happening? Yeah, this was uh, also a matter of discussion in the beginning. I think uh, we will uh, put our efforts on increasing the area rather than to repetitively approach one area. Yeah, Of course, this can then end up with a situation that the drone data that we take up several times a year uh, will not really fit to the label. This is a risk then, of course. But uh, if it comes to, for instance, tree species definition, it is important to have a large area. If it comes to uh, stem characteristics that we want to assess by LIDAR, uh, it, the, it's important to have large areas. If it comes to vitality, of course, it would be good um, to go to the areas again. But there I liked uh, your approach, actually, which we had in the last uh, project discussion, that we uh, should first record a lot of data and then selectively assess the trees in question where that some differences are visible. So I think this is also an approach we might follow. Yeah, But basically, uh, to make a point, we want to have an area as large as possible, yeah, because this is our asset in the project. Okay, great. So the next question by um, Rossi is, what tools do you deploy the workflow in the HPC cluster? So maybe I answer that one. <laughs> um, so in fact, as there exists not yet a workflow that has been fully tested and implemented, we do not yet know. But um, for sure, what we will be using, we will be using a GPU cluster that we have at the GVDG for analyzing um, the trees. And there will be, at first, we'll do set up some experimental workflow using Jupyter notebooks, but this will be more for experimenting, right? And finding out what are good parameters, bad parameters, and things like that. And also when we apply the classical algorithms, you, we may even think about using tools such as R and stuff on a small scale, just to create reference modules and, and baselines. But once um, this has to go into production, we sure we will incorporate it into the traditional HPC batch processing mode, uh, integrating the GPUs and having a fully autonomous workflow. It's not yet clear. Again, maybe it will be, con probably it will be containerized using a singularity or some kind of container solution such that it can be reproduced on the individual scientist's laptops as well um, in a Docker environment. But we'll, as said, we will see that. But certainly performance, reproducibility and um, I mean, a clear documentation, that is something that we absolutely will need to do. Okay, so the next question by um, Tara Brassard again is, um, he is wondering what is the threshold size dimension for recognizing any trees as one tree item in your monitoring model? Okay. Mm, so um, I'm not really sure what this means. So I guess uh, we have different characteristics of the tree, of course. And uh, the question is covering what resolution is necessary to uh, understand these parameters. Yeah. So basically, this is the question in the project. So I cannot directly answer it. What I can say is that we are definitely heading for a sub-centimeter resolution. But uh, this will be very challenging. I think for this multispectral cameras that I showed you, it might even hardly be possible because we need to fly very close to the trees and the resolution of these cameras is not exactly the best one. Uh, however, we ordered another camera from DJI, the P1, and this has a much better resolution. And we hope that with this camera, we definitely get below the centimeter range so that we can see you know, basically everything. You know, it's almost a single needle uh, and in a single leaf. So uh, this is the challenge of the project that we really go on sub-centimeter and understand the characteristics of the tree on this sub-centimeter level. I hope I got the question right, yeah? 
Well, I, I would have interpreted it so that maybe what if you look at what what would you define as a tree in terms of size that is included then in dynamics oh, maybe. Interesting, yeah. So the crown diameter, um, yeah. Looked from above the crown diameter of uh, uh, the deciduous tree at the age of let's say sixty to eighty, depending of course on the growth conditions. But that's it's a it's a mature tree, yeah, shortly before felling. The crown size of a of a um, needle tree, a coniferous tree, is about six meters from tip of twig to tip of twig, I would say, but it's of course not uh, round, it's a complex polygon, but let's say it's six meters, yeah. And uh, for a uh, deciduous tree, so with leaves, it's more round shaped, but there, uh, yeah, it depends very much on the competition in the stand. When the trees are close to each other, they can have a smaller crown at the same age where trees of the same age have a larger crown when they are set more free. So it's really a very complex question in practice, but I would say it's between four and eight meters of an adult large tree. Yeah. Okay, great. So next question, um, worldview three and drones, which time step of observations do you need? So I think which refers to the measurement intervals. Yeah. So uh, we plan to measure four times a year. So in every season, because uh, the appearance of the forest, of course, is seasonal. Yeah, especially deciduous trees, they lose their leaves and give us some insights from above to the stem parameters and also the yeah, uh, construction of the twigs, so to say. This you cannot see in summer when it's a uh, leaf coverage. And uh, yeah, with the coniferous trees, the difference is, of course, not so big. But anyway, we want to measure all the four seasons. So to get the maximum of information based on the biological state of the tree. And this will be possible with the drones and for the satellites, of course, it will be easily possible because the, um, as far as I learned, the world view through three creates uh, pictures on, of the whole Earth's surface uh, every day, you know, or at least every 4.5 days. Uh, so this, this is no limit here. Yeah. Okay, Cianu has a question about the equipment for label generation at a single tree level. Um, taking into account the multi-pass error to GPS processing. Yes. Um, well, I'm not an expert with GPS, so I don't exactly know what you mean by multi-pass error, but I think that I experienced this already because when selecting the GPS, I also took a very high effort. We had three companies in Göttingen where I work and we went with them to the forest, checking out the GPSs and so on. And we measured a measurement point where the position was 100% clear and found out about the accuracy of the GPS. And actually there were uh, severe differences yeah, between the results. Some uh, of the GPS even showed an RTK fix yeah, and the position was just anywhere. Yeah, so there was a big gap between what the software was uh, kind of showing to the user and what was the real precision. Yeah, because RTK fix means you have a millimeter precision, but when the points differ in a one meter range, then of course it's not precise. So uh, I, uh, when I chose this GPS, I took this into account. Still, of course, uh, we can only uh, save what the device is telling us. Yeah. And I know that sometimes uh, the error range of the signal is given with one meter. Yeah, in the forest, this is something you could live with because, as I said, tree crowns like eight or six meters large, one meter difference doesn't matter much. And uh, and also you can uh, take the point on the touch screen uh, and move it to the tree. We intend to make. Um, um, uh, um, yeah, we intend to make a picture of the forest before we assess it so that we save it as a kind of map layer so that when the user goes, he can see exactly under which tree he or she is. And when you save this tree, you can move the point above the tip of the crown then again. But uh, the fact is, when you have one meter in precision, this can mean that the real unprecise position is about eight meters. Yeah, I discussed with some experts these issues, and I guess this is what you mean with multipath error. So this we cannot manage. The only chance we have is that our position that we see on the tablet is the correct one, that we can estimate under which tree we are, and that we can correct the signal accordingly manually. Yeah. 
Okay. So, by the way, the approach, or we actually started with our joint lab session. So, if you have any lab questions, please just type them in. But so far, I haven't seen any. So, I think we can safely continue a little bit with the questions that we have here. Um, yeah, just not that you wonder. And thanks for all the um, previous lab organizers that actually showed. Um, okay, next question. Um, IO might be a bottleneck. What data model and storage type will be used? Um, yeah, that's surely true. But as we did not yet know exactly um, what we will be getting, I would say um, we, there has not been any decision made um, how this will be efficiently stored, right? But then on the other hand, you have what the devices are delivering. So the devices that you heard from Sebastian. So we have the data sources that deliver some data and uh, once we have some of this data as examples at the GVDG, we will look and think a bit more about this question, how we actually store it efficiently. Um, but so far, this was not yet um, done. But certainly it is important, as you said, because if we have 12,000 trees, um, something, right? And then you have uh, a lot of images for each tree. You have not a single image, but we have high resolution images in multi-spectral images and so forth. So it, of course, becomes an important issue. And of course, you have to make sure that you back up those data because it is highly valuable. You can't just send the rangers again for um, 100 days out into the wild, I would say. <laughs> yes. They would probably kill us. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, we are not that bad, but it wouldn't make us much happier. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> OK. I mean, yeah, it's, I nice, it's nice work, but it's definitely challenging, yes. There's an interesting question of Xiaomi uh, after she asked about the multipath error of the GPS. Uh, I suppose the drones have GPS also. Uh, that's true. Actually, uh, it's an interesting question. That's why I'm uh, heading to this. Uh, the DJI drone here has an RTK station that was also delivered with the drone. So um, this RTK station uh, is set up in the field and it is correcting the drone GPS signal, which means that the drone can have a centimeter precision of position. But there's a but. The but is that this RTK, the, the GJI calls it RTK, but it doesn't receive an online correction signal, which is actually usually the um, characteristic of an RTK. But in this case, the RTK station just fixes one position, which is maybe not exactly the position on the planet where it thinks it is. and uh, then it always sends this position to the drone and corrects the drone position. But uh, we improve this, of course, by having this GPS here and we measure the position where we set up the drone RTK station before on millimeter precision level. And then we can input this coordinates into the DJI software by so thereby changing the RTK position that the RTK thinks where it is. And then we have a perfectly correct uh, setup RTK station. Okay, great. I think there's also a follow-up question okay. by Xiaoni about this. Um, in one figure you show, it seems that you've shown the tree location and crown shape. Is this information from the drones? One figure that you show, it seems that you show the tree location and crown shape. Ah, no, no. I think what you mean is this here. Uh, this is the tree assessment. Ah, no. Okay, let's try. But no, it shouldn't be here. Here. Ah, this one. Okay. Uh, yes, so this uh, picture here comes from a study that we performed, Uni Freiburg and, and we, uh, last year. And actually, the positions that you can see here in the picture, these are tree positions. But they were recorded with um, a different GPS system. And uh, this uh, recording uh, gave me the idea to search for better GPS systems because it was a system optimized for foresters who just walk into the forest and want to give some general information about the forest. For this, it works really good. So uh, this is OK. But to get single tree precision, the system that we had was uh, not uh, to be used because it has this, um, I don't know how you call it technically, but this curled antenna, 
not such a big one, but it's a, it's a curled antenna. It has uh, the signal from the GPS. It, it's not really good. So we have precisions of two to three meters here. And these points, they are more estimations. Yeah. <laughs> so, however, from point of view of uh, putting this heat map layer over it, it might even be sufficient because the red ones were infested trees. And you can see that we always have a kind of uh, distortion probably caused by wind into this direction. So it is possible that, for instance, these three trees here caused this uh, high concentration of monotapins. Still, the conditions during this trial were not good. So I wouldn't put my head in the fire that this is a, a confirmation, not at all. We have to repeat this, but uh, yeah, so here we have single tree positions, but they are not precise. And and I think the question also arises for the um, shapes here, right? When you look at the trees, the trees here, um, the shapes of the tree crowns, they look a little bit artificially segmented. Is this segmented or is this just an image? Let's check it. Good question. Yes, this was a preliminary segmentation that was done here. So all the polygons here should resemble tree crowns, uh, but uh, there was no algorithm development behind this. The student who did this, uh, she used a watershed, an inverse watershed algorithm. You might know this algorithm from GIS analysis. ESRI developed it to understand the water flow on the ground. So when there are cavities, the water will flow through these cavities. So she inverted this algorithm so that the uh, uh, tip of the tree crown is the deepest cavity inverse, so to say, and where this watershed algorithm calculated the brim of the um, cavity, this would be then the lowest elevation, inversely the lowest uh, elevation of the tree crown. And when it goes up again, there was the border, so to say, this was the approach. It was a very uh, fast approach in the frame of the master thesis, and you can clearly see uh, what we also wrote in the paper, that the segmentation here is not perfect. However, the segmentation in this case was not part of the calculation. So it was just calculated and shown, but it was not, not further used for any single tree analysis. So we were happy with this as a first approach, but this definitely has to be improved a lot, yes. Okay, there's one last question from Anessa. Do you measure wind direction and velocity with the drones? Yes, also a very nice question. Um, first, we had some trouble with this. Uh, there is, I had a, a small drone from DJI and um, there was an app in the internet when I downloaded the um, GPX data of the drone into this app. The app had an algorithm inside which used the EMU data IMU data of the drone. So the intensity of the propeller rotors uh, in order to calculate the wind, because of course the, the drone has a flight path to follow. And when wind comes from the side, the drone realizes that it is shifted by the wind and it drags into the counter direction. Yeah? And this causes a non-geometrically uh, acceleration of the rotors, of course. And uh, the geometry of this acceleration depending which rotor draws uh, stronger and which one less this can be used to calculate the wind direction uh, this new drone here very nice actually uh, transfers this data online to the uh, to the pilot and there you can immediately see the wind speed very nice feature actually and this we want to use uh, to uh, recalculate the position of the um, order source Uh, the algorithm name is watershed algorithm. Ah, yeah, there it is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. 